you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode nine. We'll be chatting with Ezra Sipes of Summerhill Estates Winery about exactly what is a vegan or a vegetarian wine, and are they better for you than the carnivore kind? Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to REO9090 for his, her, their review on Apple Podcasts. Quote, I thoroughly enjoyed the warm and inviting intro to Unreserved. The Anthony Bourdain reference is grand. Natalie is so down to earth and a wealth of knowledge on a vast array of topics related to wine. Looking forward to regularly tuning in during my commute. End quote. Well, I am so happy that I can make your commute a little more enjoyable, R-E-O-9090. I'll continue to give a shout out to others who've been kind enough to leave a review of this podcast. So if you want me to mention your website or your social media handle, please include that in your review as well as your name, if that's not in your Apple handle. Now, back to this episode. Our guest has been involved in his family winery since he was five years old. After working in the wine production cellar, he became a published songwriter. But despite his love for music, he felt called back to the vineyard in 2008 and became chief operations officer, then CEO in 2012 of Summerhill Pyramid Winery in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia. Recently, he's become director of the Canadian Vintners Association and vice chair of the British Columbia Wine Institute. And he joined me from his winery to chat about how vegan and vegetarian wines are made, why he believes in this winemaking philosophy, even though he's not a vegetarian himself, and why you should care about and try vegetarian wines. What's the difference between, say, vegan and vegetarian wines and organic or gluten-free or biodynamic? There just seems to be all sorts of different categories these days, which are interesting and exciting, but can be confusing. Well, our guest is going to explain all of this to us because he makes some wonderful vegan and vegetarian wines at his winery. Welcome, Ezra Sipes. Hello, Ezra. Hi. Ezra, can you tell me the exact moment when you realized that you wanted to leave the music industry? I know you've grown up on the family winery, but what really made you come back to it? It was just all of the currents of my life led me there. My dad was shifting his role at the winery. He had professional management coming in for the first time. My partner, Rio, her family lived in Kelowna. We were in Vancouver together, and she thought, wouldn't it be nice to move back there? That'd be a great place to have kids. And my My brother, brother Gabriel, Gabriel, really encouraged me. He said, it's time for us to go back. And I just read the signs. That was it. Okay. Read the signs. Could have double meaning for us tonight here. That sounds fantastic. So if we look at the sort of the best and the worst so far of your wine career, maybe what is your, I like to call it your favorite failure? Something that happened, but you took a lot away from it. You learned something. It made you better at what you do or who you are. (laughs) Well, I've learned to be more prepared, which is something I didn't do that well for this interview, but I've gotten by a lot of the times on charm. My dad, when I was little, he told me, show up and look good. That's half the battle. And I've done that a few times until we did a seminar when we first were biodynamic, when we first got our Demeter certification in 2012. And everybody in the West Coast wine industry came out to see Eric von Krosik, Summerhill's winemaker, and me. And we put on a little seminar about it. And that was kind of early days for biodynamics. People didn't really know about it. So I really wanted to demystify it and I wanted to explain it simply and its fundamental things. I didn't want to talk about anything that could be construed as like witchcrafty or moon cycles or anything like that. I wanted to say, what was the meaning for the wine? How does it relate to the wine? Why does a healthy ecosystem in a vineyard make good wine? 
And so we just showed up and talked about it. And it was a little bit of a miss. I kind of regret that one. I learned a lot from it. People in their feedback said, you should have brought your cow horn with you and showed <laughs> us the preparations and all this stuff. They wanted the mystery. They wanted all of the accoutrements of biodynamics and the right. show. That sounds like it was a great experience. Now take us to the best moment, one of your favorite moments so far of your wine career. I'm sure there'll be more, but what stands out? Well, the best moments of the wine career are always in enjoying wine. When we're in the trade, we're analytical about it, right? We learn how to taste analytically, to evaluate a wine and things like that. But the best wines, you just feel them and they just send electricity through your body. Those are the best moments. That's what it's all about. That's why we do it. That's when you know it's good and when you're really creating something beautiful or experiencing something beautiful. Excellent. So Ezra, is there anything you can look back on now and maybe it was something that you were wrong about when it came to making wine? Really, you've changed your mind about it? Well, yeah, I'm always learning. I'm not an expert in any sense of the word. And something that I was sort of told and was guided towards was about wine aging. And, you know, the Okanagan Valley is a place where there's a lot of vintage variation. Yeah. There's great years and challenging years. And I was told that some of the opportunity of the challenging years is to make red wines, especially that are very ageable, that have the acidity, have the tannins and so on to have the structure to age. And so sometimes we make a red wine and we think, oh, well, this is going to be an ugly duckling. It's going to be a swan when it's older. Then the years go by and sometimes it's true but I've learned what it really needs to go the distance and when the wines fall short. And what they really need is the fruit and the nolic ripeness. So it needs that as well as the structure. And that's something I've learned that sometimes the wines fall apart before the tannins and the acid and everything comes into harmony. And there's not much to enjoy if they're like that when they're young. Sometimes they're like that when they're old. So I've learned quite a bit, which is something you only gain from experience, right? Sure. It's following these wines through what makes a really ageable wine. That's something I'm just sort of starting to really understand and develop and appreciate for. And I do love mature wines. That's uh -huh. where my heart is. It's is my it? Yeah. Thing. What is it about mature wines that you well, love, especially? I think the thing about wine is, is that it's not an industrial product, right? It's not like right. Coca-Cola. There's no recipe. So you have very few ingredients to make great wine. And one of them is time. Wine has a life. Just like an avocado is hard and then it's ripe and then it's brown. Over a much longer time span, a wine is a fresh product like that as well. It has a progression and a life to it. Time is an incredible factor in wine appreciation. Wow, that's a great way to put it. I love that element of time and not industrial. Okay, so how does the pyramid play a role in your winemaking? That was my dad's inspiration. You know, my dad is the founder of Summerhill. I don't know if we said yeah. that. Along with our winemaker, Eric, and my mom, who was there in the early days. We take it for granted that wine kind of makes itself you grow the grapes right, and you create the right environment and the right conditions for the juice to turn into wine and to mature, and that's how you make great wine. We kind of take that for granted. But when you first get into the industry, that's sort of a profound realization to go through. And my dad had that insight when he was in Champagne, in the caves underneath the limestone soils of Champagne in France, where the bottles of sparkling wine age on the leaf. And that's when he really understood that the environment shapes the wine and is part of the process. And he took that insight and said, I need to make a very special wine cellar. So he took the concept of sacred geometry, of these ratios that exist in nature, encoded it into this perfect geometry of the pyramid shape, and he aligned it to the stars. He built it with no metal and no electricity, and he made a, like a temple for aging wine, for cellaring wine. And is there any allusion or nod to Egypt and the pyramids there? Or is it just more just the geometry that's going well, there? Well, for me personally, the way I think of it is about geometry and nature and that sort of esoteric wisdom of nature. But my dad is very interested in Egypt personally. He has some friends who are Egyptologists and interested in sort of ancient civilizations and these questions about what we think we know, the sort of, what do you say, the sort of accepted wisdom about when these monuments were built and by whom and for what purpose. He's really into all those questions and thinking about ancient civilizations and what our real history might be, you know, that we don't really understand. And it's pretty fascinating. I don't know. Yeah, for yeah. sure. What makes a wine vegetarian, Ezra? Yeah, so animal byproducts come into winemaking in a process that we call fining, which is really a clarification process of winemaking. Mm -hmm. So there are sort of suspended solids in wine, in the tank, or in the barrel. And in the barrel with red wines, typically we will just use the element of time and eventually they'll settle out. 
for white wine, sometimes we want to get them into the bottle when they're fresh and vibrant. So winemakers will add a clarifying agent, a fining agent. And what it does is you stir it in. I'm not really a scientific person, so I may get this slightly wrong, but it basically binds. It has like an electro charge, like a magnetic charge that binds with some of these suspended particles in the wine. And then they form larger and larger particles. And once they're of a certain weight, then they sink to the bottom of the tank or the barrel. And then you can draw the juice out from on top of them and have a clear wine. So that's fining. And it's distinct from filtering. It's a different process. Okay. At a high level, what's filtering? How is it? Filtering is like running the wine through a filter of some kind, like a sieve. Like a a sieve. Okay. Gotcha. So some of the common fining agents are animal products. Egg whites is a very common one. Milk byproducts. Isinglass is a very common one, which is derived from a sturgeon bladder, I believe. I think that they actually can be very useful in winemaking. I'm not a winemaker myself, but my understanding is that they can do nice things to the wine. Like red wines, we've talked about tannins and acidity and all those things. And I was mentioning how time can bring those things into harmony. Well, I've been told that finding agents like egg whites can strip some of those things out of the wine and get them ready to drink at a younger age, right? So they can be beneficial in that way. Okay. is my understanding. But we have decided not to use them because we don't want to strip anything out of the wine. We want the wine to have its core. We want it to have its authenticity. We want it to be what it truly is. We don't want to remove anything from it that we don't have to. Awesome. Yeah, my dad, you know what he's on about now? He's got a committee called Organic Okanagan, and he wants the whole Okanagan Valley to go organic by 2020, which wow. is not very far away no. from now. And so a lot of our conversations are a family, are rooted around that activism and what we can do to encourage these things and change people's minds, not just farmers and in the vineyards, but also how the school district manages its sports fields and the city manages the sides of the highways and how neighbors manage their yards and all that stuff and how people can think about having a more harmonious relationship with the earth. Those are the conversations we're having now. Big goals. Yeah. Yeah. Short timeline, big goals. (laughs) That's (laughs) admirable. Really, it is. With our white wines, most of our white wines, we do use a fining agent. We use bentonite, which is a very fine clay. It's a mined elemental material. And that has the same effect as a fining agent. I mean, it acts slightly differently on the wine, but that's what we use for our white wines to get clear white wines. We do have some white wine labels that we produce very biodynamically. And we've toyed with the idea of releasing some cloudy white wines, although we haven't yet. And red wines... Most of our red wines, the vast majority of them are unfined. We barrel age them and let them sit until we can rack the quid off of the solids in it and it naturally falls out. And so why wouldn't everybody use bentonite or vegan-friendly clarifying agents as opposed to the egg whites and the fish bladders? Yeah, I think bentonite is fairly commonly used. It's not, we're not the only ones who use it. My understanding is that all of the different tools have their place. For what you want to use them for. It's a choice that we've made, sort of an ideological choice that we've made to not use them. And I told you why. It's for the integrity of the wine, which is the word I was looking for. Ah. The integrity of the wine. Right. But that is an ideological choice and it is not the only choice to make. All right. And so what would be the difference then between a vegetarian wine and a vegan wine? I don't think there would be a difference. If you're an ovo-lacto-vegetarian, I guess you could use eggs and milk and still call it vegetarian. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Oh, wow. And a few more definitions. The difference between vegan wines and gluten-free wines? Gluten-free wines is a funny one. That's just a trendy thing, isn't it? Uh, Like the gluten-free label on things. I'm pretty sure all wines are gluten-free. Okay. Fairly certain. If anybody's putting it on their label, it's probably just to cash in on a trend. Yeah, because, I mean, they're made from fruit. There's yeah. no wheat. I or... think there might be when you have like a barrel, like an old school cooper, might right. use like wheat paste in between oh. the staves. Could be. It's like advertising calorie free water or something. Yeah, exactly. I, don't know. <laughs> I think so. That's what it's that thing. So. Marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so if the label doesn't say vegan on it, are there yeah. tips or words that we can look for that might indicate it's a vegan yeah. wine? If you see a wine that says unfined on it, and you are a vegan and you really care from a perspective like religious or whatever it is that you need to have vegan food, everything needs to be vegan, then unfind, it's probably a pretty safe bet that it's vegan. Okay, great. Might be a silly question, but is it mainly vegans and vegetarians who drink vegan wine? Yeah, 
I'm not sure. Well, no, obviously not. Because, okay. you know, our wines are for everybody. And if vegetarians and vegans were the only ones who were drinking them, we'd probably be out of business. I like putting it on the labels, though, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a nice thing to think about. Like, I am not vegan, personally. I was vegetarian for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. But actually started eating meat when I moved back to Summerhill and sourced grass-fed organic beef with our chef at the time, Grant DeMontre. And I was a vegetarian for environmental reasons health reasons. I thought this factory farm meat can't be good for the planet or for my body. But then when we found that farm, I thought all the reasons I became a vegetarian, I could probably eat this. And I still am aware of the meat I eat. And I don't take it for granted. It's a big deal. There's a lot of resources. It's an animal's life. You got to honor and respect that and be aware of what you put in your body and the choices you make as a consumer. So I think that it's just a nice thing for everybody, whether they're a vegan or vegetarian or not, to think about and to see on a label. And to reflect on. I think it's just good values and good thing to put out into the world. Absolutely. And you know what twigged this whole idea as I was sharing with you, Ezra, before we started was the excellent article by Beppe Crisario, the columnist for the Globe and Mail. He had profiled you in this article along with a couple of other winemakers, but he had some interesting stats there. 2.3% of the Canadian population declares themselves vegan, which is about 870,000 people. So not a huge percentage. And then they estimate that for every vegan I guess vegetarian too, they save 200 animal lives a year by not eating the meat. Anyway, I just was fascinated by the statistics wow. of it. Yeah. So kind of interesting. And that why people become vegans and vegetarians, the sort of the caring for animal life, the environment, and of course, health issues, depending on what you believe. So back to vegan wines, would it be perverse to pair your vegan wines with meat? <laughs> no. No. Okay. I'll, actually, I'll say this. There was one chef who I won't mention <laughs> who I felt like he wanted to throw me out of his restaurant. I went to pour him the wines, and then he's like, vegan, uh, I can't sell a vegan steak for more than $20. Why would I want this wine? You know, and he was like offended by it. But that was a rare reception. That was the, the exception. Most people, I don't think, think about it. That was the only time it's ever come across that way to anybody that I've noticed. Okay. You know, I think most people take it for what it is. Yeah. Well, let's take this for what it is. Yeah. The Alive Organic White beautiful label. But I was also reading in that article from Beppe that some of the restaurants don't want to see vegan on the label. It's a bold move that you made. What was the impetus of putting vegan on that front label here? This was the first wine. The Alive series is the first wine that we labeled as vegan. And then the year after that we put them on the Alive wine, we started putting them on all of our wine. Okay. And we've been vegan for a long time, but we yeah. never put it on the label until Stephen Scheedle, who is the portfolio manager for North American Wines at the BCLDB, suggested that we put it on. He said, huh. hey, Ezra, have you ever thought about putting vegan on your label? Did you know it's the most requested thing on the sales room floor for wine? Wow. More than organic, more than low alcohol, more than whatever else people are interested in. People are asking for vegan wine. Mm. And I had no clue that it was a thing or that people cared about that. We've been vegan for a long time. I said, sure, I'll put it on. And then I've grown to really like it and really think it's a very cool thing to have on there. But that's why it's now on all of our wines. That's cool. But I, I just thought it was fascinating. Yeah, that, and I wouldn't think it's as that. big a risk as declaring yourself organic in that bad years, mildew, rot, disease. You might have to backpedal. Oh. But with vegan, I would think the clarifying agents are a little easier to control year on year. Oh, I see what you mean. Like, like less risky as a producer. Yes, yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. There's no need for animal byproducts in the winemaking process. You don't need them. Right. They're a nice thing to have if you want to use them. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, by Andrew, the way, yeah. same with organic. Yes. You don't need any synthetic anything to have a healthy organic vineyard or control mildew. Yes, uh -huh. you're operating without a safety net. Yeah. Yes, if you have mildew, okay. then there's not much you can do about it as an organic producer. You can keep it at bay, but very hard to deal with it once you have a bad infection. That just means you have to work hard to prevent it and to have a good ecosystem. And we've been doing this for 30 years now, wow. organically. Wow. And we've learned a lot along the way. And it is not at all impossible for any farmer of any scale to do. Okay. Well, there you go. So let's taste this one, Ezra, the Alive okay. Organic yes. White. Here we go. And this is so lovely and floral. It is reminding me of walking through this meadow that's on the label. So the yes. significance of the various can I, can little Can I tell things? you about that? Yes, please do. All of those plants and things mm -hmm. are what's growing in the vineyard. So there's a chicken feather. We got chickens on the farm. We've got clover, which is a plant we encourage on the vineyard ground cover. We have dandelion right there. 
yeah. and horsetail and yarrow flowers. And those are three things that we make biodynamic preparations out of. They're all things that we use to make our fertilizers and preparations for mildew control or that we encourage on the property to keep the ecosystem vibrant and healthy. So that's the story of that label. This is a lovely yeah. wine. Nice and floral, springy, fresh. Mm, beautiful. Is it a blend? The, it's a grapes? blend. So the Alive wines, we blend them with sort of a goal in mind, which is to be extremely user-friendly. Mm. A wine that we know everybody is going to like. They're dry wines. Some people don't like overly aromatic wines. They're dry, light wines. But they have enough aromatics to keep them interesting and fresh and vibrant and kind of just delicious, right? Mm -hmm, I love absolutely. aromatic wines. I think yeah. it's delicious. Yeah. They're dry wines. They're not so dry that they're searing. Well, mm -hmm. I call them like California dry. So it's kind of like under six grams per liter of residual sugar. And by the way, that's unfermented grape juice is what that sugar is. There's no sugar added. Right. So no chapter. So they re really yep. kind of hit all the marks. You want a dry, mm -hmm. light wine rather than a sweet aromatic wine, but it's just a little bit of aromatic mm -hmm. and not so dry that it's searing or painful to drink. It's mostly Kerner and Pinot Gris is the okay. bulk of the blend. The base of this wine is Kerner, which is part of the Okanagan's history. It's a Germanic varietal yeah. wine. A current, well, variety is the way to say it. It's a Germanic variety that was planted in the Okanagan in the late 70s as some of the test blocks to see whether vinifera would survive the winters here and make decent wine. Okay. And, yeah, it's related to Riesling and all that kind of stuff. And we ferment it quite dry and it's quite a steely acidic sort of germanic it really gives the wine its backbone right and then we blend that with pinot gris to give it a little bit more mouthfeel and lusciousness those are two dry wines and then we blend in very small percentages of aromatic wines and it varies from year to year this year it was chardonnay i think actually mm -hmm, it's yeah. and riesling? what else riesling maybe riesling yeah yeah that's what's on the back yeah, just label a, just yeah. a, a pinch of those wines, just a few percentage each. There might have been a little bit more Geritzterminer than Chardonnay and Riesling in this blend. Basically, it's like using your spice cabinet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Just to bring up the aromatics, bring up the mouthfeel, whatever it is you want, bring up the acidity, whatever you want to do with those blending agents. That's how we blend the white wine. This one is super young, right? This is 2017. Yours flew over the country to get to you. Mine came right from the cellar where it was made. So I don't know about yours, but mine still has a little bit of frizzante, like the carbon dioxide that was just a product of the carbonation is still in the wine. Like it's very, very fresh. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely though. I smell the meadow and the bees. <laughs> <laughs> and the price point on this is about... In BC, it is eighteen fifty, I believe. Awesome. Is what it is. Pre and do, I know everything's been going on in the courts and everything, but do you have a wine club or do you ship? Oh, goodness me. Every... Yeah, it's our constitutional right. Of course we ship. <laughs> okay, well, you heard it here, and I'm happy to promote that. <laughs> Excellent. Many people say they're allergic to sulfur. Do vegan and vegetarian wines have less sulfur? Organic wines have less sulfur. I met somebody, I've met one person who is allergic to sulfur. She works in the hotel trader, her name is Star. And Star came to visit us at Summerhill, and we were crushing grapes. It was harvest. So we were out on the crush pad and stars like, yeah, I can never drink wine. I'm allergic to sulfur. And we we're like, oh, well, this is your lucky day. You can drink the wine juice before it, it starts fermenting. We haven't added any sulfur to it. And star had a sip of the juice and started having an allergic reaction. Oh, no. Just from the sulfur that is Natural. present in right. grapes. Right. So that is a sulfur allergy. Very few people are allergic to sulfur. But sulfur, you can be sensitive to it in larger amounts. And it can dull the character of wine in larger amounts. So I think the CFIA allows up to 350 parts per million of who's sulfur added to wine. Who's the CFIA? CFIA, the Canada Food Inspection Agency. Gotcha. So like the health rules right. around making wine are that there is 350 parts per million of sulfur allowed. And then under the organic program, you are allowed up to 100 parts per million of <laughs> sulfur per liter, I think. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't know how that works. That's but anyway, right. 100 parts per million yep. under organic. So there could be less, I think is the answer. And you're yeah. both organic and biodynamic, are you, as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our vineyard in Kelowna is certified by Demeter as a biodynamic vineyard. Okay. And that is, I think, the world's first organic certification and still one of its most stringent. It has extra rules above and beyond organic. So organic is sort of the baseline, which yeah. means that there's no synthetics being used, basically. 
and then there's guidance on things they want to see about soil preservation and biodiversity and things like that. But biodynamics really codifies that. You have to have at least 10% of your farm given over to nature habitat. And we have, I think, about 20 or 25% of our farm that's wetland. We have a dry land. We have a meadow habitat. And then you really view the farm as an ecosystem. You integrate animals and animal manures. And you really focus on making your own fertilizers from things you grow on the farm. We make a horsetail tea for mildew control. We make large amounts of compost and we add these herbal preparations to the compost to aid processes of decomposition. We spray a special preparation called PrEP 500, which is basically a bacterial broth that we spray all over the farm that aids the life force, if you will, in the soil. But basically the soil food web, all of the mycorrhiza and beneficial bacteria and all that stuff that lives in the soil. It's like a starter preparation for those yeah. things to establish. Do you also bury uh, the bull's horns? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The way you make those preparations is really far out. It's really cool, <laughs> actually. My brother Gabriel is the farm's biodynamicist, okay. and he makes all of this stuff. And it's really cool. And it has an element of spirituality to it. He times the things he does with the moon. He packs the manure of a lactating cow into a cow's horn and buries it under a moon phase in one season and digs it up under another season. And it's quite beautiful, actually. It really connects him to the universe, gives him meaning in his life. And it's quite amazing to see the transformation that happens in those cow horns. You know, it's wet cow manure when it comes in. And when it comes out, it's like this cakey black substance with all the white mycorrhiza running through it. It smells like sweet earth, like it's really quite an incredible transformation. And then we use that to make the bruise and he stirs it. It's quite beautiful. Yeah. And what I've heard too about biodynamics, no matter what you think of it, it's closer attention to the vineyard, to the land, to the seasons. And that has to be a good thing, whether or not you believe in biodynamics or not. Like even if you're a big skeptic, I still think it means paying very close attention to your vines and so on. Well, it's been demonstrated there's more earthworms in biodynamic farms ah. than either organic or conventional farms. Okay. That's been that sort of a scientifically proven thing. Okay. And I think that's a pretty good indicator that the farms are healthier. Absolutely. Ezra, <laughs> your dad has a book on spirituality. How much has this translated into your life? My dad just wrote a book. I think he's revising it for a second edition called okay. The All One Era. And, you know, it's funny. My dad is an entrepreneur. He always has been. He was driven in business and to make money and to succeed in life at an early age. He actually retired to the Okanagan and couldn't stay out of business. He opened the winery as his retirement project. And with all of these values in everything we do and everything we purchase and the choices we make as a winery, there always is a deeper meaning beyond just making money. Of course, it's a business. And of course, you have to make money or else you are not in business. But if my only purpose in life every day was to wake up and make money, I don't think I would be as happy a person as I am, right? right. And yes. I don't think Summerhill would be as amazing a place as it is. Those values, yes. we get wonderful staff who come because it's a values-driven organization and because it is a spiritual place, for lack of a better term, a place that takes into account just the sacredness of life and the meaning of people's time and energy, you know? This is so holistic. I'm loving this. Let's take a look at your vegan red wine. Sure. Uh, Ezra, another beautiful field-like label. Very nice. So do you have a favorite pairing for this red? Well, just like the white, the red is blended to be extremely versatile and just to go with just about anything. Yeah. It will go great with red meats. No question about it. It's got everything that a wine needs to stand up to that kind of food. Grass-fed beef, though. Grass I prefer grass-fed beef myself. That's what I eat. <laughs> Vegan cows, <laughs> at least. Yeah, that, yeah, right. Well, look, that's how cow stomachs are designed. It's yes, I just that's grass, true. You know? The ruminants. Yeah, this is lovely. Berry, wild field berry aromas. Very juicy, too. Very mouth-watering. Mm -hmm. Juicy. That's, yeah. that's my word for it. Makes my mouth salivate just saying the word juicy. So, <laughs> very nice. What are the big challenges in making a vegan wine? Is there anything in particular that's more challenging about making a vegan wine than a well, non vegan wine? Well, yeah. Basically, it's just less tools, right? Okay, yeah. You have less tools, so you have to get it more right in the vineyard. That's all it is. Okay. This wine, by the way, is a very Okanagan wine. I think there's three different grapes in here. Okay. It's mostly Syrah and Merlot. Mm -hmm. 
and some Cab Franc. And Syrahs are developing a reputation from the Okanagan Valley because they're yes. quite distinct. It doesn't taste like the Rhone. It doesn't taste like Australia. It tastes like the Okanagan Valley and it tastes good. Yeah. So Syrahs are kind of a thing. And Merlots could be a thing from the right sites in the Okanagan Valley. Merlots can be incredibly expressive from the Okanagan. They can be very structured and age-worthy and quite beautiful and much more right bank Bordeaux than Central Valley, California awesome. from the Okanagan Valley. Yeah. However, people plant Merlot because at the time they were planting it, everybody was buying Merlot. So people weren't really thinking about site and growing it for quality wine when they were planting it. So there's a caveat when I say Merlots could be a great wine from the Okanagan Valley if they're planted and grown to be a great wine from the Okanagan Valley. And then Cabernet Franc, which is also, of course, does very well in Ontario and the Okanagan, also very expressive. So this is a real blend of winners from the Okanagan and blended to be versatile, to be juicy, very to be vibrant. smooth, yep. to have some structure, but not dry out your mouth or no. make you pucker. Beautiful mouthfeel. Yeah, no, it's great. I can see it for a large gathering, but yet it's not boring or anything. It's just, it's not going to no. polarize people. And this was fermented actually in... 10,000 liter oak tanks. Oh, this okay. was the natural yeast that lived in the tank. And you can taste that. You can taste a certain thing that's not necessarily fruit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's what I love about a lot of French wines and European wines is that sort of tasting the environment, tasting the cellar yes. and that really specific character that comes from a cellar. And I love that about this wine. It makes it very not boring. Yes. Right? Very non boring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are quite the tasting notes. Not painful to drink. Very non boring. <laughs> So we should go with the positives. We should figure yeah, out how exactly. to say that in a positive way. I think that's damning Exciting. with faint praise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the difference between natural wines and vegan vegetarian wines? Is there yeah, much of a yeah. divide? Natural wines is an undefined term. Right. What I think of natural wines, I think these wines you would probably call natural enough. Mm -hmm. So there is some ideology behind them, but there's also some things that we do, like the addition of sulfur up yeah. to 100 parts per million, to make sure that they taste like sort of a mainstream definition of wine, that okay. they don't yeah. sort of spoil, become oxidative, develop volatile acidity, things like that. They don't spoil. Right. A natural wine, I think of as wines where the ideology trumps that and they could be allowed to spoil. Mm -hmm. Not always. I mean, that's kind of a weird thing to say. But I would say natural wines are more ideological than these, and they will have less or no sulfites added would be the difference between these wines and something that somebody would term a natural wine. Mm -hmm. I would call these a natural enough wine. Natural uh, enough. <laughs> I yeah. like that. You know where I got that expression where? from? Where? It's from the champion of natural wines, Alice Firing. Firing, yes. Yeah, okay, I yeah. I was lucky She's enough to- written books about that, to, yeah. Yeah, I tasted wine with her in Nova Scotia. We were both there for the Atlantic Wine Symposium, and I got to share wine with her over the course of two days. And- what a fascinating, brilliant person she is. I love tasting wines with her. And she gave me that expression, natural enough, which I really think is the right word for it. Yeah, That's fantastic. Do you use natural yeasts? Yeah. So part of the organic certification is everything that we use in the production cellar. We have to like list it. It's like a bureaucratic process and we have to submit it to our organic certifiers. We have to have a paper trail with receipts and mm -hmm. so on for everything that we use in our production process. And they have to meet certain criteria. One thing is no GMOs. So a lot of commercial yeast these days are genetically modified mm -hmm. to have certain outcomes. So we're not allowed to use any genetic modified yeasts. And we do use some commercial yeasts for some uh, products, but for many other products we don't. For instance, this red wine is just the yeast that lives in the cellar and in those tanks. Right. All right. I do not want to miss this third wine, your Blanc de Blanc. Oh, yeah. Is this all Chardonnay or what's, what's in here? This is 100% Chardonnay and this is a pre-release. Okay. Oh. So we're just about to re release this wine okay. any day now. It's just about to become available. It's sitting in the pyramid. Uh, oh. it's, it was disgorged. This is a traditional method of sparkling wine, so it was mm -hmm. aged with the yeast in the bottle. Okay. So we removed the yeast from each individual bottle only about five weeks ago, six weeks ago. Mm. Wow, and that's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And oh, uh, this is a 2012 vintage, so we really okay. let it sit and develop. And Natalie, let me just point out to you, just the mouthfeel of the yes. bubbles, the creaminess, yeah. the texture. Absolutely. It's Isn't so that beautiful. Rich. To go back to time, it's the only way to accomplish that, yeah. that kind of bubble architecture. It's also a gusher. It's great. <laughs> it's very <laughs> mouthwatering. I love it. <laughs> Is that what that means? Gusher? Like the a acidity? gusher. Yeah, the acidity, the waterfalls <laughs> along yeah. the sides of the mouth. <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's love a good one. it. 
Okay, I gotta just make a plug for Chardonnay sparkling wine from the Okanagan Valley. Go for it. It's the best. Okay. <laughs> we have a block of Chardonnay at Summer Hill Vineyard and that was planted with clones from Champagne. And it has a great illustrious history of recognition. In the year 2000, the Chardonnay Cuvée, our site's Gabriel from that block, won a gold medal in France Ooh. at the Chardonnay du Monde. The That's only true. five gold medals at the competition, four for Champagne and one for that wine. Wow. And then in 2010, the Blanc de Blanc won the Denby's Trophy for Best Bottle Fermented Sparkling Wine at the International Wine and Spirit Competition in London, England. That's another tough one. Yep. That's the top award for bottle fermented sparkling wine at that hmm. competition, the number one. And then it's won a gold medal at Decanter and all sorts of other things. And this is the brand new vintage about to be released. Fantastic. And I see the pyramid there on the yeah. label. Very elegant. Yes. Very different, but suited to this style of wine, the celebratory, beautiful champagne. Thank you. Uh, champagne. Sparkling wine. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got fooled there for a moment. It's lovely. Okay, so I do not want to run out of time before I ask you a few questions. You had a gadget there, speaking of sparkling wine, yeah. that you wanted to share with us. This is the indispensable wine gadget at my house. Okay. Because I'm a lightweight. Like, I like to drink wine with yes. food and everything. But I can never finish a whole bottle. Even between me and my wife, we won't finish a whole bottle. We are like a glass of wine a day kind of people. So I need wine to last on my counter or in my fridge. So this is the indispensable sparkling wine saver. Yeah. Right? So it's like spring loaded. Yeah. So it really like and then you makes grip a it. nice seal. And then there's so much pressure in this bottle, so much carbon dioxide. Yeah. So it rings under the glass there and keeps the pressure in. You need that because those mushroom corks, you're never going to get that back in the bottle. No obviously. way. And yeah. a cork, if you shove a cork back in there, what's going to happen is the carbon dioxide is going to fill up this space, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. And it's going to create a lot of pressure. And in your fridge, you'll wake up the next day and the cork will be long gone out of the bottle. It'll eventually have blown. Okay. <laughs> and there'll yeah. be sparkling wine everywhere, right? Um, so yes, you need something that will really keep it in. So that is an yeah. indispensable thing. Fantastic. Good gadget. Thank you for sharing that with us. So Ezra, this has been fantastic. I can't believe how fast this has gone. Where can we find you online? Oh, yeah. Thank you. We're at summerhill.bc.ca, okay. British Columbia, Canada. Okay. That's yeah. where you can find us. And we do ship all over the country. And it's our policy, not just as a one-time thing or a special thing. We always do complimentary shipping okay. on minimum orders of case okay. slot orders. And we also have a really cool sort of innovative wine club program that we started. We have two. One's like a regular subscription service. Mm -hmm. And one's this thing called our ambassador program, which is it's almost like a points reward thing. Okay. But it's really good. It's 10% of what you buy. So if you spend $100, you get $10 credited to your account for your next purchase. All right. Cool. And if you tell your friends about it and they sign up on your recommendation, this is like our pyramid scheme, like multiple level marketing, you get 5% <laughs> of what they buy on your account. That's why we call it our ambassador program, which is pretty good. So there's no money. You can't make money doing it like a pyramid right. scheme. You just get more wine, more organic right. wine. That sounds and good. it's only two levels. It okay. doesn't keep going and going and going. So <laughs> I think it's pretty well designed. And people who recommend things can drink a lot of delicious organic wine. Excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. A wonderful conversation. We could have talked twice as long, I know, but we really appreciate you being here tonight and all that you do to bring us these wonderful wines. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. I love Ezra's insights into making vegetarian wines. He's so earthy. No pun intended. So here are my takeaways from this discussion. Number one. Wine isn't an industrial product because it incorporates the element of time and it has a life during which it changes. Number two, biodynamics is not about witchcraft, but about respecting nature. Even the pyramid in which his wine is aged is a reflection of the sacred geometry of nature. I love that, sacred geometry of nature. Number three, there are usually more earthworms and vitality in the soils of biodynamically farmed grapes than there are of organically farmed grapes. That was a surprise. Number four, there really isn't a difference between vegetarian and vegan wines. Both do not use animal fining products to clarify the wine, such as fish bladders or egg whites. Instead, they use bentonite clay, as do a lot of other winemakers. 
Number five, there is no standard definition for natural wines, which often refer to wines with little winemaker intervention. But Ezra believes that vegetarian wines are, quote, natural enough. Number six, if a wine label states that the wine is unfined, then it's likely a vegan or vegetarian wine, as this is the only part of the process that really introduces an animal product. And finally, number seven, you can happily pair vegetarian wines with meat, whether they're free-range, organic, or not. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. Or use the hashtag Unreserved Wine Talk. You'll find links to the social media channels for Ezra, reviews of all the wines we discussed, and bonus tips for this episode at nataliemcclain.com forward slash nine. Next week, I'll share with you my wines for seduction and to pair with chocolate just in time for Valentine's Day. And my next guest on the show will be Katie Bell, wine columnist for Forbes magazine. She'll be here to chat about her favorite wine travel stories. Now, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, join me in a free online video wine class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. Cheers. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.